When you say but, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. When you say but, you've gone as far as you can go to get the very best. When you say but, wiser, you've said it all. Just really quickly before we get into this episode, I just wanted to announce that we're giving away two tickets to Busch Gardens Tampa to see their brand new fireworks and laser spectacular. To enter, head over to Expedition Theme Park on Instagram and take a look at our latest post to enter. Now back to the episode. Thank you so much for joining the expedition and stay safe. Houston is America's space city where the moon and the stars can belong to anyone willing to work for it. In 1965, the Astrodome, the world's first multi-purpose dome sports stadium, was rising over the horizon. The sports venue would become the home of the Houston Astros. As the Astrodome prepared for launch, on a 105-acre plot 10 miles to the east, the Missouri-born Gussie Bush was nearing completion on the 4th Budweiser Brewery with cosmic expectations. Once opened in 1966, the Texas plant produced 900,000 barrels of lager per year, the largest brewery in Houston's history. The manufacturing facilities absorbed a quarter of the land. In the late summer of 69, Gussie Bush formally announced what would become of the rest. Welcome to beautiful Bush Gardens, Tampa, a delightfully different kind of family entertainment. Following the brewery tour, you begin your descent into this tropical haven. It's soon apparent why each year over three million visitors come here to enjoy these fabulous surroundings. Anheuser-Busch enjoyed early success in themed entertainment with two Busch Gardens parks adjacent to their breweries in Tampa and Los Angeles. The latter opened the same year that Houston came online. Risk taker that he was, Gussie couldn't resist the urge to explore the garden's concept further, and Hustletown was next. William Lund was hired and completed a feasibility study for Gussie's next theme park idea, Bush Gardens Houston. They concluded that another zoological attraction in the area would not be viable. Bush went to bat anyway. Gussie was on a hot streak, having just overcome a labor strike sparked by the Houston brewery that May. In fact, Gussie was so convinced of his winning formula that the same year Busch Gardens Houston was announced, 1969, the company declared that their ninth brewery of Fourth Park would soon be constructed nearby the James River in Virginia. So when you come to Tidewater, Virginia, be sure to spend a day or a night or both in the old country at Busch Gardens, Williamsburg, Virginia. Architect firm Randall Duell and Associates, who had recently worked on neighboring Astroworld and the Texas Pavilion at the 1964 World's Fair, were named as a design and planning firm for Busch Gardens Houston. Joseph H. Liness was hired as the landscape architect. Liness's team had just converted a handful of oil platforms in Long Beach, California into the Riviera of the West. Construction on Busch Gardens Houston began in late 69. The following January, Gussie revealed to the press a scale model of the park, revealing a striking pan-Asian theme. With a construction budget of $11 million, trucks of vegetation whirled over the brewery grounds, being planted as quickly as beds were ready. That winter was dry, helping the gardens flourish. Jerry Lentz, a native of St. Louis, was plucked from the Houston Zoo to create Bush's collection of animals, including monkeys, elephants, deer, Bengal tigers, rhinoceros, and more than 30 species of mammals. And of course, there were birds. Scores of them. Tropical, Asian, and otherwise. Halfway through the Houston Gardens construction, Anheuser-Busch executives undertook an eight-year plan to commercialize their outdoor attractions, which to this point had been emission-free facilities to promote beer sales. Parks were now expected to subsist on emissions revenue. They also announced a $10 million enhancement for Busch Gardens Tampa, 
as Bush Entertainment's prototype park. The upcoming Williamsburg was still in planning and development, and would be cast in that mould. The other gardens, however, had to learn to fly all by themselves. On May 29th, 1971, Busch Gardens Houston officially opened to the public. The destination was divided into two areas. The wildlife exhibits, rides and other attractions constituted the large gardens and required a mission of $2.25 for adults or $1.25 for children. Alongside the large gardens were the mini gardens, a smaller set of animals and other displays. These mini gardens charged no emission. The 40 acre compound including one hospitality house with the requisite free beer for adults. Build as the gardens where east meets west, guests could best understand that principle on the Ceylon Channel boat ride. Cruising in water propelled canal boats, passengers voyaged about the majority of the large gardens. A port of call in the middle of the route allowed guests to disembark for the petting zoo, which featured lambs, goats, and llamas. The highlight of the channel was a passage through the domed ice cave, home to penguins, polar bears, and sea lions. The boat ride also passed through the free flight cage, a close-up encounter that was also accessible by foot. Walkways took guests into dramatic environments, all within the Asian theme, to observe majestic beasts and avians. Speaking of avians, Busch Gardens Houston offered the bird circus just like its sibling parks. In keeping with the Asian setting, the show was re-themed as the Tales of Baghdad. The Middle Eastern Bird Amphitheatre seated 950 people, housed a dozen or more macaws and cockatoos, and in the Texas summer, smelled amazing. There was one more ride on offer, the Orient Express, made to look like the early British steamers from the Empire during the 19th century. This narrow gauge locomotive was a coal fired model produced by Crown Metal Products of Pennsylvania. The short circuit circled pens, forded bridges and framed the southern border of the park. Of course, the Clydesdales would appear at the Houston Gardens too. Early on, the company acknowledged that late summer heat may force operating hours to change for the animal's protection. Sadly, a male rhino died of acute indigestion before the park had even opened. Complicating matters further, there were the notorious Houston cold snaps that would force the park to close over the winter holidays, dealing a significant blow to admissions. In its first year, Busch Gardens Houston fell short of its attendance target of 800,000 visitors. To correct the situation, Busch opened its second season with later hours and more offerings. The elephants were turned into a ride for little ones. Clowns and other performers strolled the grounds. Baghdad told its tales multiple times in the course of the day and community groups were invited to take a center stage in a new entertainment venue. These measures were the best response that Bush could muster. Beyond the capital of the Sunbelt, the busy year of 1972 saw the company's operations expanding rapidly, including new additions to the other Bush Gardens and the activation of the Williamsburg Brewery. Bush Gardens Houston committed to the mission, put on its best show, and when the second season attendance was tallied, the news was not good. Gussie himself went on record stating that all efforts to improve the situation have been unsuccessful. In just one quarter, Bush Gardens Houston posted a loss of $4 million. One local newspaper went so far as to proclaim the project a disaster. The finance folks saw it a little differently. Anheuser-Busch leveraged the park's losses by recasting the gardens as a sales promotion facility, allowing the brewer to use the park as a write-off. The following year, Busch Gardens Houston was converted to Busch Bird Park. The grounds were greatly reduced and all rides were removed. The circus remained as well as other feathered friendly exhibits. The hospitality house poured samples, brewery tours were offered and admission was free. Community groups and organizations continued to retreat to the grounds, which maintained a lush, tropical feel. Bush Bird Park even sold merch. In summary, the Houston's Garden became a throwback to Tampa's original experience, and operated as such until 1976, when advertising budgets needed to be increased to combat the oncoming threat from Miller. 
In January of 1977, Bush Entertainment published a white paper to dissuade the James City County Board of Supervisors from moving forward with a proposed emission tax. A PR campaign complained that similar burdens at other parks had caused irreparable harm. Operations in Houston, the press were told, were officially curtailed. The brewery expanded over the years since, increasing Houston's output to 14.2 million barrels annually. The stars of the bird circus were shipped off to the other gardens. The remaining mammals from the park went off display in 1973, quietly transferring to zoos and other gardens, presumably. Of the gardens where East met West, nothing remains. Yet not all hope is lost. At Lagoon Park of Farmington in Utah, just a 20 minute shuttle bus from Salt Lake City Airport, the old locomotive runs on the tracks of the Wild Kingdom train. Riders gaze upon the park's critters from the same fancy steel coaches built 50 years ago. Honoring the train's legacy and the gardens which took wing but never soared, the narrow gauge was renamed Houston. Facing tremendous odds, Gussie Bush built a third theme park to satisfy his lofty ambitions. Though he had the right stuff to meet nearly every previous challenge, the grandson of Adolphus Bush took his eye off the ball in H-Town, and when his bat shattered the air, the heavens merely shrugged. The tigers roared, the parrots trilled, some tourists flocked to look about, but there was no joy for Bush Gardens Houston. Mighty Gussie Bush struck out. When you say bug, it means you want the beer that's got a taste that's number one. When you say bug, you tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say bug, you say you care enough to only want the king of beers. There is no other one, there's only something less, because the king of beers is the Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. Did you ever visit Bush Gardens Houston? Let me know your stories in the comments below. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and subscribe to join the expedition. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for upcoming episodes, and a special thank you to our Patreon for supporting the channel. We will see you next time. There is no other one. There's only something less Because the king of beers Is leading all the rest When you say Budweiser You've said it all When you say Budweiser You've said it all